on today's show. Head out with the Aqua Kids to Connecticut as they collect horseshoe crabs and learn how they're important ecologically, economically, and to human health. Plus, get a good look at horseshoe crab fossils dating back hundreds of millions of years. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. everyone at home and welcome to another awesome episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Drew and I'm Katie. On today's show we're working with some animals that are oftentimes overlooked. What are those? Horseshoe crabs. Oh, I don't overlook horseshoe crabs. <laughs> well that's good you don't. They're both economically and ecologically very important. That's right. Let's go meet up with researchers from Project Limulus to learn more. All right let's go. So how many juvenile horseshoe crabs did you find today? Uh, one so far. All right how big is it? It's gonna be about 56 millimeters across. Hey, Dr. Beaky. Hey, Dr. Beaky. Hey, Andrew. How are you doing? Good. Good how, how are you? you? I'm doing well. What's going on here? Uh, we're taking some measurements from some juvenile horseshoe crabs. And why? <laughs> so it's part of a little bit larger, larger project called Project Limulus okay. um, that we run out of Sacred Heart University. And we're basically concerned about the ecology of horseshoe crabs in Long Island Sound. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to track the population abundances, whether they're going up or going down. And part of that is actually working with the juveniles. Hmm. So why is the work on horseshoe crabs important? Well, horseshoe crabs are ecologically, economically, and important for our human health. Ecologically, when they come up to mate, they lay a bunch of eggs in the sand, and a lot of migratory shorebirds are dependent upon those eggs to actually fuel their migration northward so they can lay eggs in the Arctic okay. and come back down. Uh, economically, horseshoe crabs are used as bait for whelk or conch, as well as eel, and that's economically important because the people harvest them, sell them for bait, um, and then ship those, those products, the whelk and the eel, to Asia to be processed and come back here as food. But probably the most important thing is, is their blood. Horseshoe crab blood is, is, has, is blue. blue. <laughs> right, right. It's blue because it's got copper in it. But the more important thing is they have this almost like a white blood cell that we have in our veins or in our blood system that takes care of uh, you know, attacking things that come into our blood system, infecting us. Horseshoe crabs, these amoebocytes, basically are used by the biomedical industry to detect endotoxins in everything that has to do with anything that goes inside your body, from vaccines to artificial joints uh, to saline solutions. And so everything is tested with horseshoe crab blood. There's no synthetic alternative. And hmm. so without horseshoe crabs, you know, we could actually get wind up having a lot of contaminated vaccines. And so conserving them is hugely important at this point in time until we find some synthetic alternative. Interesting. So we can thank the horseshoe crabs for any vaccine or medication we've ever had. Yeah, and I would say you could thank the horseshoe crabs for your health. And how are horseshoe crabs doing in the wild? It's kind of scary to think that without them, we could have all these contaminated vaccines. And in Delaware Bay, horseshoe crabs are actually starting to increase, whereas in the New England area, and especially Long Island and, and further north, we're actually seeing populations decline. So one mm. part of our project that we're doing is, is looking at juveniles to see how many juveniles are coming into the population mm -hmm. uh, and seeing if they're surviving and how fast they're growing. And the second part of the population looks at adults and see where they move and if the populations are also increasing or, or decreasing. Mm. And so Jacqueline is actually doing a, a big study on juvenile horseshoe crabs across Long Island beaches, finding and trying to classify habitats of where we find them and where we don't. And cool. so actually I'm going to let her tell you about what she's doing and we'll actually get you to hold some juvenile horseshoe crabs. Fun. <laughs> awesome. I never knew horseshoe crabs were so ecologically and economically important. I know. Don't go away. When Aqua Kids returns, we actually get to catch some juvenile horseshoe crabs. Fun. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. Horseshoe crabs have been around for a very long time. Can you guess how long they've existed? Is it A, 50 to 100 million years, B, 200 to 300 million years, or C, over 400 million years? I'll reveal the answer after the break. Did you guess the number of years horseshoe crabs have existed? The answer is C, over 400 million years. Archaeologists have found fossils of horseshoe crabs that date back as far as 450 million years. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're headed back to the beach to catch some juvenile horseshoe crabs. All right, Katie and Andrew, let's walk down the beach and see if we can find some juveniles. All right. All right. Oh, it looks like there's one right here. All right, here we go. Ah. Oh. All right, got two of them right here for you. Awesome. 
So my project that we're doing this summer is we're going to the different beaches and we're trying to, oh sorry, find the different juvenile horseshoe crabs and we want to categorize their size and where exactly they've been found. So we've been using GPS units, we've been using quadrats, um, two meter squares, and we're trying to figure out the density. In Long Island Sound, the density is really low. So we want to see um, the essential habitat that these juveniles require so that they're able to grow, get all the nutrients they require, all the food, so we can increase the population within Long Island Sound. And what are some ways to increase their population? Um, well, that's what basically my project is trying to find out. We've been taking sediment samples to see what kind of sediment they're trying to um, go into. We're also going to look at the different organisms that are in the sediment that these oh, juveniles wow. are potentially eating. And then eventually we're going to get pH, dissolved oxygen, and any other kind of environmental factors that could be contributing to their survival. So what do these little guys eat? <laughs> a lot of them eat what's along the seafloor, the detritus, and they also really enjoy eating the white soft-shelled clams. So that's the majority of their diet. Is the detritus just the sediment that's found here? Um, it's basically any of the dead organisms that are decaying at the bottom, so they definitely just feed along the floor as they move. That's okay. what I like to eat, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the importance of your project? Like Dr. Beaky mentioned, we really want to understand the ecology that these baby horseshoe crabs are um, experiencing. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we want to help increase their numbers so once they get to adulthood, we are still able to use them in the medical industry and for um, economics, all those reasons we mentioned before. And it will be also good for um, managers and um, so they essentially know we can help make protected areas around the sound for the juveniles. How long do these guys live? We think they live for about 20 years and they do reach their terminal molt at age 12, so they don't last too, too long. So we're looking for um, crabs on the beach that are laying eggs. And here we have uh, a female and she's surrounded by two males and uh, she digs in, uh, lays the eggs, and then the male passes over and um, fertilizes them. This is one of the males that's um, uh, part of the mating group here. Mm -hmm. What are these things? Yeah. Um, horseshoe crabs are uh, a habitat all by themselves. They have many different species that live on and around their shells. All right, this is the uh, female horseshoe crab and uh, she was digging in the sand, uh, laying over 10,000 eggs wow, at really? one time. Wow, really? A lot. Yeah. And you can see um, her compound eyes up in the front here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she, this one is in very good condition. Um, she doesn't have many things growing on her like the male does, so you can see all of her um, different parts. They're amazing in that their mouth is in the middle of their legs and they kind of chew with their knees. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty different. Uh, they breathe with uh, gills along the back of the um, abdomen here and they have a covering that's kind of like leather so they call it a book gill. Looks oh. like a book and the little um, lamellae in between look like pages of a book. Wow. Horseshoe crabs will never harm you, so people really shouldn't harm them. They're very important to our health, and they're economically um, extremely important. Um, this is not a stinger, so it will never hurt you, um, unless you, I guess, step right on it. <laughs> but if you're careful on the beach, um, uh, you should be uh, treat the animals with respect and, and don't harm them. I think our guest aqua kid, Emily, here has a question for you. Sure. How are they important to our health? Well, everyone can thank their good health to the horseshoe crab because there's a derivative in their blood that's used to test vaccines. So if you had a flu shot or mumps, measles, rubella shot, they have to make sure that what they're injecting into you is pure. And the horseshoe crab blood tests to see if it's contaminated with bacteria. So actually everyone uh, has been influenced by um, horseshoe crabs. That's another reason we want to make sure they survive. So how do you track horseshoe crabs? Well, actually, about 18 years ago, a student asked me, you know, how do we know if this horseshoe crab has ever been here before? Mm -hmm. So we decided to start a tagging program. And Adam is going to show us how we do that. So basically what we have is we have this small little white disc tag. Each one has a unique six-digit number on it and a phone number and a website. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we're going to use this modified awl to basically poke a small hole 
into the side of his shell. So one thing we want to do is we don't want it to be hanging off like that or up near his eye or have a little wheel or anything like that. You just hold that for me. What we're going to do is we're just going to take it and make a small hole right here. It just goes in. Sometimes a little blood comes out, but it doesn't hurt them. They don't have any nerves in this part of their shell and they'll just heal back up. And then we just pop the tag in and then he's all set to go and then we find him again. So where have people found these guys? We pretty much found them all along uh, the Connecticut coastline everywhere. So we're in New Haven. We might find this guy next year in Milford. We might find them all the way up into Groton, all the way down into Greenwich. So they freely pretty much move all along the coast. We've even had a few recaps where we tag them on Connecticut and they actually find them on Long Island. So they really move around, but they don't usually leave Long Island Sound. Mm -hmm. hmm. This is Amanda Cruz. She's my undergraduate Hi. research Hi. assistant. And she's been helping me all summer track horseshoe crabs. And they come up every spring and lay eggs in the beach. And we're gonna look here, this is a nest. You can tell a, a crab was here recently. So we're gonna peel back the layers of the sand until we see the little green eggs. Whoa. Whoa. So you can see inside the egg, there's a spinning larvae uh, going around and around. It looks like a trilobite, and you might be able to see one at the museum later today. And they are developing, uh, later on they'll hatch out, and then after their first molt, they'll have a, a tail and look more like the, the big horseshoe crab. So how long have horseshoe crabs been around? Well, let's go find out and check in with Dr. Bacon. It was great to see that there are efforts in place to increase horseshoe crab numbers in the wild. Very true. Don't go too far. When we come back, Dr. Beaky shows us just why horseshoe crabs are called living fossils. We're back. Let's go meet up with Dr. Beaky to find out more about horseshoe crabs. All right, let's go. After learning all about modern horseshoe crabs at the beach, the Aquakids headed to the Yale Peabody Museum to get an idea of the history of these guys. When walking into the museum, the Aquakids made sure to check out the Taurosaurus found in front of the building. So guys, we're gonna see specimens that are hundreds of millions of years old. Wow. So Katie, Emily, and Andrew, this is Dr. James Lambsdale. He's a postdoctoral associate at Yale University, and he conducts research on horseshoe crabs at the Peabody Museum. And he's gonna to explain to you why horseshoe crabs are called living fossils. So why are horseshoe crabs called living fossils? Well, I have some uh, specimens here that I can use to show you. Um, here we have uh, a suite of specimens from uh, the earliest period of horseshoe crab evolution um, through to uh, very close to today and then all of the one species here. Wow. And so these specimens are about 150 uh, to 90 million years old and you can see these look almost identical um, to the species we have today. Um, so for about 100 million years they've persisted um, without really changing their shape in any way. So this one here, this is um, a specimen from what we call the Silurian of uh, Estonia in Eastern Europe. It's about 420 million years old. And you can see, first of all, that this is very, very small. It's much smaller than any of the other specimens we have on this table, and it's a fully grown adult. So the earliest horseshoe crabs were very, very small uh, compared to what we see today. The, the real main difference is that you can see that it's still got individual body segments. Um, and in these uh, one groups, you can, they're fused into what we call a thoracitron. But here, they're still retained as individual um, pterogites or body segments. So they can sort of overlap against each other and enroll. Um, and the main difference uh, throughout the evolution is that they have fused up into the thoracitron. Um, so these individual segments in these ones are um, just a single shield, and you can sort of see the individual ones still here. So how do you work with fossils? Well, there are a number of things you can uh, do with them. One of the things I've been looking at right now is this specimen here, uh, which is about 90 million years old, and it's uh, from the Cretaceous of Lebanon. Um, and one of the things you can see on this is it's got this interesting bump on the front of the head. Oh, yeah. Now, if you look at all of the Bond species, the only thing with a bump on the head is this one here, which is uh, Tachypleus tridentatus, uh, which is from uh, Asia. Um, and this is a male, and you can see here, this has a very clear sort of shovel at the front. Oh, yeah. And this is to help it sort of uh, get up on the female when they're breeding. Um, so nothing else in the fossil record that we've ever found has this bump. So this suggests that this fossil, which is 90 million years old, is more closely related to this modern species than it is to any of these other species on this table. Now, how many species are there today? 
Well, today we only have four species. Um, here I have um, males and females of each of the modern species. Uh, this is Limulus polyphemus, which you guys saw on the beach earlier. Right. Um, and these are the different Asian species. We have two of Tachypleus and one of Carlson Scorpius, which is very, very small. Hmm. Um, it's kind of sad that we only have four today because there used to be a lot more in the past. Um, obviously, there was a lot more time um, and a lot more diversity. Um, but each of these things, are, uh, each of these species are, are kind of doing um, pretty badly at the moment. They're mm. very stressed. There's a lot of uh, environmental changes going on. Um, and one of the things I do do with my research actually is using how these things are related uh, to kind of see how the morphological variability has changed through time. And we can see that um, the horseshoe crabs are a lot less variable than they used to be uh, because we are reduced just to these four modern species. Here we are in the collections of the Division of Invertebrate Paleontology, and this is where we store all the fossils that aren't on display in the museum. So we have about 30 specimens that are on display in the museum and about 4.5 million in drawers and on compactors <laughs> wow. behind the scenes. That's a lot. And um, for the entire museum, there's about eight, there's about 13 million specimens that are in the collections. Wow. And we don't have them on display, but researchers can come from all over the world to look at the fossils here, or we send them out on loan. And the fossils in here are up to 550 million years old. That's really neat. Is there any reason why it's so cold in here? <laughs> <laughs> so it's so cold because we need to maintain the temperature and the humidity because over time, if temperatures change, if the fossils change temperature, um, they can break down. So it's, it's more important when you have specimens like birds or the plants that are different mm -hmm. divisions of the museum, but we try and maintain cool temperatures and reasonable humidity to stabilize the fossils in the collections. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so can we see some of them? Sure, let's have a look. Wow. James, here's another drawer of uh, Euperops. That's the 305 million year old horseshoe crab from Illinois. Mm -hmm. And we've got about 800 more of that same species for you to work on. Yep. Oh, wow. Who catalogs all this stuff? This material is cataloged by staff, um, the divisional staff, and also by um, a group of about four or five undergraduates and graduate students who I employ throughout the year. Um, to make sure that they're cataloged electronically and photographed so that they can be seen by, seen by people all over the world. Um, and they also use that data set to do big analyses to look at how climate changes um, through time and how animals react to climate change over time. Mm -hmm. So what's the importance of doing all this research? Well, what we're doing right now is we're digitizing all these fossils. That means that we catalog them electronically and put them into our database. And in doing that, we keep track of what the species is, where on earth it was found, how many years old the specimen is, and we also take a photograph of it. And that way, researchers can access that data from all around the world at any time and um, use it to answer big questions. And the big qu questions that we're trying to answer right now is what is the effect of climate change on animals? And so we're looking at what's happened in the past to how animals have responded to climate change to answer questions about how they might react in the future. And that's very important. It is crazy to think that we were working with specimens that were hundreds of millions of years old. Not only that, but it was also cool to see how the species have changed over time. Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be right back. Here's our top story. The horseshoe blood test becomes a big business. Most people know horseshoe crab blood is blue, and for that reason, it is very unique. But its strange baby blue color isn't the only thing that makes horseshoe crab blood distinct. In fact, horseshoe crab blood contains a chemical found nowhere else in the world. The chemical is called coagulin, and recently it has been found extremely important in the biomedical industry, as the chemical is able to detect traces of bacterial presence and entrap them in a gel-like substance. 
Because of this amazing quality, the FDA mandates that every new drug and surgical implant, such as a pacemaker, first must be tested with horseshoe crab blood to make sure it is safe for human use. Who knew these living fossils were so helpful? I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. We're out of time for today's show. That's right, Drew. From catching juvenile and adult horseshoe crabs on the beach to studying fossils that are hundreds of millions of years old, we learned all about how important these animals are. A lot of people overlook horseshoe crabs, but it's true. They're extremely important to our economy, to our environment, and even to our health. We need to take all measures possible to preserve this species. That's true. We can thank Dr. Beaky and his team for that. They help us to remember that everyone can do their part to keep our planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website to follow us on our journeys. And learn how you can come along with us so together we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua Kids. Aqua Kids.